Greetings customizers, welcome back to Talking Hands Customs. For all my subscribers, thank you very much. And if you're joining us for the first time, voila, here comes the next episode. What are we gonna do? Well, we've already covered uh, in this camouflage series how to do hardline camouflage. So you use masking fluid or tape or post-it notes or whatever to create a hard demarcation line between two separate colors. Um, the example for that was a Slaughter's Marauders Skyhawk. Next up is going to be a little bit of a twofer within a twofer, which makes it a fourfer or a sixteenfer, depending on who you ask. I'm going to be doing UK Action Force, uh, so we're going to go international with GI Joe. Why not? Because I'm Canadian, and I'm going to show you how to airbrush freehand camouflage. Now, if you're still in the hand brushing world, which is outstanding, freehand camouflage is you basically drawing a pattern. So the advice I'll give to you is to study the pattern you want to replicate, practice it on a spare sheet of paper or a, a spare sheet of plastic like I'm about to do and nail down your pattern first before you apply it to the custom you're trying to work on. Because like we spoke about in the very beginning of the series, that different countries do di camouflage patterns different ways, right? There's difference between American and British and Canadian and everybody in between. Uh, they all have their different uh, philosophies for camouflage. So study the part you're doing first before you commit paint to plastic. Uh, the reason why I emphasize that is we are talking about UK Action Force and their camouflage patterns are different than what you might be used to. So it's good to pay attention to that because what I found is even if you match the colors perfectly, if you don't match the pattern, you'll lose the illusion. And that's what we're trying to do, right? Just capture that illusion and put it onto a custom. Um, for those of you who are still new to the channel, um, my aesthetic is to replicate Hasbro style uh, toys. So we're not going for ultra realism. We're taking it that if Hasbro kept doing what they were doing in the late 80s and taking vehicles and reassigning them to uh, sub teams that we would follow that aesthetic. So in this case, we're taking vehicles uh, in two Skyhawks, who Slaughter's Marauders for one and UK Action Force for the other. So the reason why we're going to practice this is that this is what really unlocks the power of the airbrush. Um, it's one thing to uh, smash color onto a custom in large blocks like the Hasbro aesthetic tends to be. Um, or even if you're doing your own thing, if you took a stinger and made it a desert stinger, for example, um, that's a lot of large color application, in which case you don't have to be so worried about the finesse of the application of the paint color itself. Now, when we get into masking camouflage, the masking medium that you use, whether it's tape or the fluid um, or anything else, is that's what's controlling your paint. Yes, it's your airbrush settings matter, but if you don't get the paint exactly where you want, that's fine because chances are it landed on the masking. In which case, when you remove the masking, that color is no longer there. In this case, we're going to the opposite end of the spectrum. We are going to be completely responsible for where every drop of paint goes on this. Uh, it may seem intimidating uh, and that's normal um, and it does take practice. Uh, the reason why we're gonna do this on a spare sheet here is to show you the different ways paint comes out of an airbrush and how you can manipulate the airbrush uh, by position and distance to create the effect you want. Um, in looking at UK Action Force camouflage and even bringing it back to the American side of the house, the camouflage on the APC, even the uh, collector's, uh, whatever they called it there, the collector's collection edition or whatever, the basically the camouflage, the brown and green camouflage X30. Um, there will be hard and soft edged camouflage. So in this case, this will be soft edged camouflage, but not so soft as to be almost nebulous. You'll still see a firm demarcation line between the two colors, but that line in and of itself will actually be somewhat diffuse, if you will. It'll be soft. It won't be a, a hard, solid line. So like I said, this is where the airbrush really comes into its own. Um, I've got my paint pre-mixed here for this demonstration. I'll be painting on plain white plastic and I'll be using Vallejo's Leather Brown, uh, model color of Leather Brown, mixed with Vallejo Thinner for the uh, camouflage pattern itself. So um, relating this to the G.I. Joe world, I don't know, that guy Avalanche who has brown splotches on his white uniform, if that needs, if that satisfies anybody's curiosity. Um, so anyway, um, let's begin. So I'm gonna do this by, I have to put my mask on uh, for safety reasons, for using the airbrush. So there'll be some delay potentially in between what I do uh, and the after action discussion on it. So just uh, be patient and watch what happens because moving pictures are worth a bajillion million words. 
So first what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you the differences in control you get with a dual action airbrush. I'm gonna start with heavy application and move all the way over to light. And there'll be plenty of this uh, air booth light coming on and off, so mind your eyes as well. Okay, so what we did here is we held the airbrush roughly perpendicular to the surface we wanted to paint, and that was full pressure and um, full paint, right? So we have the ability to control with a dual action how much air comes out and how much paint comes out. So that was full trigger on that one. And as you can see, there's some inconsistency there, sure, as the airbrush warms up. Uh, and that's why we always do a test spray. I try and keep it on camera as much as possible so that you want to test and make sure that the airbrush is spitting out paint when you want it to. Then I just took about maybe half trigger, half pressure, and you can already see that that line got much thinner. And then I just started going lighter on the pressure uh, on the trigger for both air and paint. And then you saw how many times I had to draw this eight to make it start to show up. So you can see that's the kind of control you can get. You can do this with a single action airbrush but you have to dial the pressure more on your actual air compressor whereas right now my compressor is set at a steady let's call it 38 psi um, and that paint was thinned normally let's call it uh, 70 30 paint to thinner so 70 percent paint to 30 percent thinner if you start modifying your thinner to paint ratio let's say up to 50 50 um, you're going to get much thinner, much wetter paint coming out, in which case you need to dial all your pressures down, maybe even to about 10 PSI, uh, in order to gain that control. By doing that, you'll actually have to paint more. Um, and that does serve a purpose. Um, and what I found through experience, whether it's technically correct or not, is some paints need to be thinned more than they're prescribed to be. Uh, and you might just have to take more time painting that one individual piece. Uh, the airbrushes can be a finicky tool, but uh, it is an important one. So the other thing I want to draw your attention to here is the outside line here. So if you remember, this is almost reminiscent of using a spray can just on a smaller scale. You can see all that spatter around there. I'll use, uh, let's use a trusty pencil here. So you can see this spattern around the pattern. So that line's not very clean at all. So if you were to do, if this was a camouflage stripe and you did them close together, with all of this spatter on the outside of the line, you'd actually be uh, altering the other color. So let's say this was yellow if we were doing a mod of, you know, like some kind of tiger force or something like that. Um, you would actually be darkening the yellow um, between the brown splotches. So this is actually not desired. This is good for just applying one solid color on, let's say, like I said, uh, you take a stinger and you want to make a desert stinger. So yeah, you can blast away with your airbrush on full power and get lots of coverage fast, but it's not, there's not much finesse to it because that's way too fuzzy for what we want to do. So moving over to the next one, yeah, there's some splatter here because my airbrush is still getting dialed in. But now you can already see by dropping back the pressure, look how much cleaner that line's become. It's still very feathered, and you can see some inconsistencies here in the thickness of the paint, but that just comes with repeated passes with the airbrush. But the difference between this and this is like night and day, right? This will far less affect the pattern that you want. And then coming over here to the right, even more so. Yes, the paint is uh, much more faint, but look at the control on that line. I'll bring it even closer here, right? So now you can see the difference between <laughs> full power, let's call it medium power, and then light power, okay? And then even lighter. Now, the reason why I show you that is to show you the control you can acquire with an airbrush. And if you decide to go down the realistic road, you can use this type of airbrush application for applying weathering and battle damage. And then this here is just an exercise to show you, aside from my sloppy penmanship, that you can actually control and draw with the airbrush. Um, if you've never seen it before, artists do it all the time on cars and on paintings. Um, but as an average model builder and a customizer, uh, I can do the same thing and then therefore so can you. Uh, and even there, right there, you got that super faint line right there, barely anything on there. 
So that shows you the control you can acquire. By extension, by looking at this, we can pick which line we would use for applying camouflage. And I would say it would go in between, somewhere between there and there. If we were being super finicky and wanted to be super clean, this is probably the line we'd want to choose. So what does that mean? Well, now, the reason why I drew the eight is to show you that you can draw an organic pattern with your airbrush. So now what we're gonna do is I'm going to draw one type of camouflage splotch and show you how to color it in. Because now what we're doing is we're almost turning the airbrush into a pencil crayon. So we draw the outline first and then we gotta shade it in, okay? The trick behind that, which I'll tell you before I even start spraying, is making sure you get even coverage within and it will take maybe more than one shot. Um, it may seem like a lot of work, but I promise you on the larger time scale of making your custom, you won't even notice you're doing it and the results you get will absolutely convince you that this is the way. Not to quote the Mandalorian, but I just quoted the Mandalorian. Um, so in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw the outline first and then fill it in. Um, and that's the trick with holding your airbrush per or perpendicular excuse me, to your painting surface. I'll actually take one quick second and I'll show you what happens when you don't hold it perpendicular to the surface. Watch your eyes. a few more stripes in there and I'll tell you why in a sec. So you can see what happens now when I hold the airbrush more parallel to the surface as it comes out like a burst like that. And you can see that no matter what I do with the uh, air pressure or the paint volume coming out of the airbrush, you get the same shape. So you get a solid leading edge and then you get a feathered trailing edge. And then I did it more lightly over here with less pressure. Now what this means is that I just showed you how you can do scorch marks on your vehicles. So if you wanted to do laser blast marks or something like that, even on a, on a diorama you're making, that's how you do it. You hold the airbrush close to parallel to the surface and then you squeeze off and this is very light and it will aim down there because the spray comes out like this. So that footprint is what's creating that, that pattern on the, on the plastic. And then what I did was I did full power and I actually pulled the airbrush a distance away because this is something I didn't say before. So this is the same as this because they're both full pressure, full paint, except I held the airbrush way further away. So to show you that the distance you hold your airbrush away from the model also matters. Okay? And you can see how much splatter that is, how undefined the line is. Is there a place for that? Yes. Uh, when you do the more realistic style of weathering or you're making a diorama. But if we're going to do the Hasbro aesthetic, we need to keep our lines tight because that will not give you clean camouflage. The color will go down so uh, transparently that you won't have a pattern at all and it will look like a mess. And that's not what we want and that's not what you're capable of. You're capable absolutely of doing something like this. Okay, so there's the other thing. So we want to keep our um, airbrush perpendicular to the surface that we're painting on as much as we can because imagine if you were trying to paint like this and you got paint on a, another surface that you didn't want it, right? So this isn't good for control. Uh, this is what we want right here, okay? So I'm just gonna remask up and now we're gonna draw a camouflage splotch together. The splotch we're gonna do, I'm gonna call American style because it'll look like something off of a woodland pattern. It'll just be one splotch, not multiple splotches together because I'm only using one color, but it will be a woodland style splotch.
Okay, and within reason here, I've got to reach around my phone stand, not to make excuses, but now you can see here that that has a relatively sharp, soft edge. And I know that sounds like a contradiction or an oxymoron, but in this case, when we were showing the refinement of the airbrush line itself, that's what we we're looking for, right? So I drew a little gobble pattern here and I outlined it and then I started coloring it in. Even this edge could be refined a little bit further, which leads me to my next tip. When you're drawing a camouflage pattern, draw it smaller than you want it first. Because if something goes wrong, my airbrush is actually starting to sputter. I might have to order some replacement parts. But in this case, if you draw it smaller than you want it, it helps you refine your line. So a couple of times when I was holding this, because it's a sheet of paper or a sheet of plastic, um, my hand was actually turning the plastic as I was trying to keep it steady. So uh, draw it smaller and then build it out to the size and shape you want. But there's a camouflage splat, uh, splotch right there. Um, pretty clean edge. I could probably refine that a little bit more. But um, by doing that, I'm bringing the line, I'm bringing it further out and trying to draw on that edge. And then when I color in, this color, or excuse me, this coverage is pretty consistent. I would probably go over it a little bit more just to make sure that it's solid. Um, and that's what really sells it, is that it's one thing to have the feathered line, but to make sure that you get that coverage in there. And you don't want to increase the volume and pressure on your paint uh, to color it in like you would maybe on a computer or using the side of a pencil crayon or something like that is that you want to maintain that same line and just work the paint inside the shape you've drawn. Uh, and what that does is if you were to magically increase your paint or whatever, depending on what's going on with your airbrush, it might splotch out, in which case you get uneven coverage or it might even ruin your pattern. Um, and one thing that you'll have to do in your airbrush and camouflage more than likely is you'll have to go back with the original color and help it trim in some of your shapes or maybe a shape got away from you and you want to reshape it. Um, and I have to do it all the time. If that's a lack of skill, then so be it. But um, you will have to go back with the other color and potentially refine your shape. And the same principle applies is bring that other color back up and start edging it towards there. Because if you get a hard line in there, you'll have some hard and some soft. So that means it's time for the public service announcement about the accuracy of your camouflage. If you look at Hasbro vehicles, and I haven't said this in a few uh, tutorials, so we'll mention it again. Hasbro vehicles have imperfections. What that means is you have every license to make imperfect things. So my camouflage line here is pretty good. I would tidy it up maybe a little bit. Is it perfect? Mm -hmm. Is Hasbro perfect? Uh -uh. Take a look at some of the vehicles you have, whether the it's the APC cover, Tiger Force stripes, Python Patrol, what have you. There are inconsistencies and imperfections within, so don't hold yourself to a standard that not even the toy company did. Um, you'll be chasing insanity, and that's not what we want, right? This is supposed to be fun. So there's an American splotch, okay? Um, British splotches are relatively the same. They have some stripe, like, almost look like blades of grass through them, so we're not going to bother with that. However, because we spoke about Action Force, we are going to try one of their splotches, and it's weird because I don't do... UK stuff all that much American and I mean digital is weird but the traditional woodland pattern which has been replicated with multiple colors uh, over the decades is more North American and we're more used to seeing that pattern so now that's why we have to practice so now I'm going to attempt to draw a UK action force pattern on the same plastic and show you the difference so here we go
All right, now what we've got here is something vaguely reminiscent, close enough to the kind of camouflage splotch that you see on the UK Action Force ATC, which was the original inspiration for doing my UK Action Force Skyhawk. Um, so as you can see, they usually have, they have two different kinds, that's why I drew different patterns, is they have this very elongated uh, swatch, let's call it splotch, with sometimes another little stick that comes out of it. Um, and they'll change shape or whatnot, and they'll be this orientation. So if we were looking at the side of the ATC, they have their camouflage lined up like this. It's almost like a bunch of sticks, if you will. And then on the top, and in some other places, they will have almost like a clover shape where it's got these four kind of leaves on it, if you will. Uh, and there's variations on these two themes. So the American pattern, yeah, you know what? Let's do something one more time here. I'm just gonna show you that's maybe not the best version of an American pattern because it looks too much like that. So as you can see, that's how difficult it is. Now I'm changing countries here. So just hang on one sec. And maybe that's more indicative of a splotch on a woodland pattern because you'd have the brown and the black and the green in there and they're all kind of interwoven and they have different shapes as well. Um, so it, it is a little difficult to explain camouflage. It's like, what is an American shape? What is a, a British shape? So in this case, what I'll say is, look at the camouflage you're studying, right? I said that in the very beginning. So look at the camouflage that you want to replicate and mirror those shapes. Um, you have multiple... Um, styles to choose from and they will look different not just be if you switch out colors right american woodland like i said i mean there's the herb subdued urban version that white black and gray horrid stuff and there's everybody's favorite the old pink combination etc etc uh british dpm there's variations of that throughout the world um so look at the camouflage you're trying to replicate pa practice the pattern first if you don't have a sheet of plastic like this uh because you haven't done any scratch building or anything like that or you don't want to waste it um, then by all means practice it the design on some paper towel or even a sheet of paper over your paper towel there a blank paper just to get used to your hand just to train your hand to do that that style of shape and you'll find that once you nail it then you can transfer it onto the plastic and you're just it's muscle memory you're just repeating it over and over again so um, while maybe not 100% true to source material this is what I wanted to show you in that different camouflage will look will have different shapes to it. And not replicating those shapes may lead to you losing the illusion that you're trying to get across. So, um, enough with the practice pattern. I'm gonna show you what the final result can look like. So hang on one second. And now we're gonna do a double reveal of the two types of camouflage on the projects that we've chosen for this scenario. Um, in this case, I only showed you the camouflage pattern applied to a sheet of plastic, but I did do a custom in this style already. So, may I present to you the Action Force Kestrel. The Kestrel is a type of hawk. It's also the name of the prototype Harrier, which is a jump jet or a VTOL, which is exactly what the Skyhawk is in the G.I. Joe universe, so I thought there was some nice poetry there. For the UK Action Force style, we have the slash camouflage on any perpendicular surface, like on the ATC. And on a parallel surface, we actually have a splotch type. So there's two different patterns uh, for the black color in this camouflage scheme. The airbrush itself, again, we've unlocked its true potential by freehand painting this, uh, this black on here. Uh, you've got that nice feathered edge throughout and it gives it that British uh, or UK action force look to it. So I think that this captures that uh, and the point of using the airbrush extremely well. The second reveal is the final reveal for the Slaughter's Marauders Goshawk. I call it the Goshawk because that's a hawk that flies around in Canada, 
which sounds really simple. It flies around wherever it wants to. But anyways, there's goshawks in Canada. Um, and it's also the name of a U.S. Navy trainer aircraft. And bottom line up front, even though I like putting Canadian stickers on my stuff because I'm, in, I'm Canadian, uh, without the United States, there would be no G.I. Joe. So let's not forget that fundamental fact. Um, and here's your hard-edged camouflage. So now you can see the difference in the line between the Kestrel and the Goshawk. Whereas the airbrush provides that feathered edge and using a masking fluid or masking tape gives you that solid or hard edge between the camouflage. And depending on your point of view, it can be the difference between night and day. Um, it could be the difference between having a custom that almost looks like what you want it to and a custom that looks exactly the way you want it to. The uh, colors that I used here for the Kestrel, going back to that, uh, was uh, just a Vallejo regular black. And this green is a color called Green Zinc Chromate. If you've ever tried to replicate UK Action Force, uh, it's a little difficult because their ATCs change color wildly over time. Uh, I used an internet recommendation initially um, from someone who painted an ATC and it looked phenomenal when I replicated it with the same colors. Uh, for whatever reason, it just wasn't the aesthetic I was looking for. I was looking for that lighter green look. So uh, in this case, I used green zinc chromate and like I said, just the regular black. The skis are 3D printed. Um, and there you have it. The chair is painted black as well. The peg for the action figure inside is not painted. Uh, the other thing we did in this series was also repair the pin on this canopy so that it now functions again. So with all of this being said and done, this is what the airbrush does. It applies paint with a mask or without a mask in a thin layer that prevents you from having paint buildup. And it also lets you draw camouflage with that soft edge that represents either other countries or other toys style or a realistic style of airbrush or of uh, paint application, excuse me. Now here's the 2.5 reveal. As I said, when we did the Grizzly that I would show you the difference between airbrushing and paint brushing. So let's put the Grizzly back on the screen. Now, aside from the difference in vehicle, and I said I was gonna try the new green on the uh, Goshawk, so it's a slightly different green here. The other two colors are the same. This is hand brushing, and this is airbrushing. So overall, the effect is the same. The paint's a little thicker on here, but as long as you do it well, you won't notice. So if the airbrush is not an option for you for whatever reason, hand brushing works just as well. The one disadvantage being that as illustrated by the Kestrel, I won't say it's impossible because I've seen people do it, but to get that feathered edge with a paintbrush is a chore and a half. So that is the power and the strength of the airbrush, is the different ways that it can be applied to match the subject you want to recreate. So having said all of that, this also takes practice. So don't be frustrated and practice before you apply it to your final custom. Also, if you look at things like Tiger Force, Slaughter's Marauders, anything G.I. Joe, there will be inconsistencies in their paint application. You'll see a mix of soft and hard edged for things. That happens, and if Hasbro can do it, so can you. So try not to be too hard on yourself if you're not getting the results you want right off the bat. All of this stuff takes practice. So in conclusion, I want to thank you all for joining me on this. To my subscribers, thank you very much. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. And we will see you on the next adventure. In the meantime, be safe and have fun.